stew maker. But he is not using a machine. He's using his own self to make a shoe. That's right. He is a person who specializes in making shoes. And um, he, it's handmade. Like Ariane said, it's not machine made. He actually has to put together the different parts of the shoe. Here, I've got my shoe today. Sewing together the sole to the shoe itself, piecing all parts of it together. And it takes him days for a single pair of shoes, days. So you can imagine why they're not gonna try to do that on their own. Even a person who that's their specialty to make shoes, it takes them a long time to make a pair. Was it two days, Ariansh? Mm -hmm. Um, in history today, um, I had uh, some things come up yesterday and wasn't able to film the video, um, but I've got a video for Mrs. Campbell to go through chapter four with you and take some notes on continuing with Jamestown. So you're going to hear a little bit more about Jamestown. That is the colony that we're going to spend the longest on since it's the first one, and then we'll move into uh, new colonies next week. Okay, and then science is officially your owl pellet lab day. So this is the day that you get to break open your owl pellet, find what bones you have in there, try to figure out what type of animal it is. You'll spend some time cleaning them to be able to really see it properly. So you've got tweezers in that little baggie. You've got some toothpicks. Those are gonna be the best ways to clean off the bones so that you can see them better. The magnifying glass is gonna be good for looking at really close details of what the bones are like and help you to identify once again what kind of animal it is. Glenda, can you use a cup of water to like make the skin get a bit softer? Yes, you can use water, good question, to soften it a little bit. Um, I will tell you that's going to make it a little bit messier, but it would make it easier for um, to clean the bones for all of the things to fall off the bones, which would include include hair and maybe some like hay, dried uh, grass. So yes, water will definitely soften it. Kruthi? Can our parents help with this? So definitely. Can... Yeah. I would highly suggest your parents helping you out with this. Um, it's possible that they would, um, require you to do it with them present because it's very messy. So it's quite possible that your parents are going to say, you have to do it with me outside or in the kitchen or wherever it might be. Make sure that you're in a place where you'll be able to clean up after yourself pretty well. Ariansh? For the Owl Pellet Lab um, for today, you said there was going to be a video of you um, dissecting the Owl Pellet, but the only video I see is a video of someone else dissecting it. I um, said that, I, I guess you misheard me or maybe I misspoke. I don't have any extras to dissect. Um, in fact, Mrs. Cristiano's class, there's not even enough pellets for each student to have their own. So there weren't enough for the teachers to have one to show the information. Um, it was more important for me that you guys each got one. Um, and so that's why I have a separate video for you to watch a different science teacher. Oh. Yeah. So the only extra that's in the classroom right now is for Dikshita since she didn't get hers. But um, as soon as she does come to school, she'll be able to get hers. That's the only one that's um, extra at school right now, though, is for Dikshita. And I want to save that one for her so that she gets an opportunity to do the lab. Yes, Alexander? I'm sorry, but my parents won't help me. My dad was like, okay. But then when he, like, I showed him pictures, nope. I showed my mom. She doesn't even like chickens. Nope. Oh, so they're grossed out. That's why they're not going to do anything with you. They leave it with me. I, I don't mind mom. doing that, but when it comes to a frog, I think I'm just going to skip that school day. I don't <laughs> like frogs. I'm scared of them. 
Yeah, but this is not going to be gross because it's all dried. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just the bones. It's not anything like the organs. I'm ready for it. That's right. Okay, well, we need to get started on our schoolwork. Um, let's pause on the owl pellet conversation, although I'll um, check in with you guys at the end of class as well to make sure that there's not any questions before you start. Um, I do apologize for not being able to have a video where I coach you through it. Um, that video that I found, I think still does a really good job, um, but it's just because we didn't have enough owl pellets for me to actually break one apart. Okay, so let's go over the Pledge of Allegiance and school motto and start on some monograms today. Dikshita, can you lead us in the pledge? I pledge of allegiance to the Pledge of the United States of America, to, to the Republic for which we stand, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor. You can see, say the honor code as well. Honor. I'll honor those things which are good, true, and beautiful. Respect. I'll show respect to others at all times. Service. Service. Show good things to others without being asked. Excellence. Excellent. I'll strive for excellence in all things. Perseverance. I'll feel commitment and not give up or act on discouragement. Thank you. Join me for a moment of silence, boys and girls. Okay, let's start on some phonograms. We are a little behind in time, so we're just gonna do um, a few. We'll keep it short. Okay, let's begin by writing I, three letter I. Please write I, three letter I. Great job, Dikshita and Alexander, Arsha, and Simhita. Here's I, three letter I. Okay, next, let's do E, I. We say E, I, but we write I, E. Good job. And finally, let's do one more phonogram that says an I sound. Let's do yeah, it, I, E. Yeah, it, I, E. Just like that. Okay, that's all the phonograms. I know that's quick. Let's move on to some spelling words, though, that are going to be on the quiz tomorrow. It is a quiz day tomorrow. First word, please write porcelain. I think to spell this one, porcelain. Porcelain. Morning, Sahanasri. Good morning. Can you talk? Porcelain. Check that yours matches mine, and if it doesn't, make corrections.
next word is going to be syllable. Syllable. Syllable, syllable. Do we have to mark? Yes, you should be marking these. But just try your best. You don't get all of the markings, it's okay, but Harika, Alina, and Dikshita, think about where would I mark this word? Syllable. Excellent job for those of you who remembered the double L. Dikshita, it looks like you remember there's a double consonant, but you did double B instead of double L. Next up, let's do tortoise. We think to spell tortoise. Tortoise, we think to spell tortoise. Next up, parliament. We think to spell parliament. Great job, Ty. That's exactly right, Parliament. Next step, last one for today, Congress. 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 Great job. We need to have a double S on that word. Okay, that is all of our review today. We will just do a little bit more review tomorrow. But let's get started on a new lesson. You can erase your board and let's get out our binder ready for a new lesson. Okay, boys and girls, also, um, hopefully you submitted your poem, The Hayloft. Um, if you are going to be a little late in that, that's okay. But we are going to start focusing on a new poem altogether starting today. We are going to start learning a poem called When Earth Becomes an It. Um, it is from your poetry book. And 
It's a great poem um, in honor of Earth Day, which is next week, um, focused on basically uh, why we need to show respect to Earth and the resources that we have, not just thinking, I'm going to take up everything without really thinking about it, but be thoughtful about taking care of the Earth, um, of resources and animals included in that as well. The Wilders and Farmer Boy do a great job of showing respect. Um, as we're going to see, and I want us to really focus on this, especially next week, uh, like when they butcher animals, they use every part of it, including the fat. Um, with crops as well, they use every single part. Remember when they were like picking apples, that the good apples they used, and then the bad apples they still gave, or they still like made preserves out of. Or they used watermelon rinds for preserves. Remember Eliza Jane? She was mad about Lucy getting a watermelon rind, which is the outside of the watermelon. Because she was thinking, we can use that though for some preserves. They don't throw anything away. They use everything. And that's a great example for us. Um, Tyke, did you have a comment or question? I got to find the Um. I didn't have enough time to do the Halo presentation. Um, That's okay. You can submit it late. Okay. Just letting you know, though, that we're going to stop reviewing that poem and we're going to start with this new one. Um, I'll go ahead and show it to you now before we start our spelling lesson. And I'll get a video posted soon and put this in um, BrightThinker. Okay. Now, do you guys know of um, how some people call Earth Mother Earth? Because it provides for us, like a mother provides for their child, for her child. So um, that's what we are going to be talking about in this poem. Basically, show respect for the Earth, thinking of it like a parent who's providing for us, giving us good things. And don't think of it as an it, just like this random object that's just going to be thrown in the trash, right? Show respect for the earth. Here it is. When earth becomes an it by Mary Lou Awiakta. When the people call earth mother, they take with love and with love give back so that all may live. With love give back means basically like putting things back into the soil and making sure that new trees are planted, things like that. Now, when the people call earth it, they use her, consume her strength. Then the people die. That's what happens when we just use up things from the earth without really thinking about it. Already the sun is hot out of season. Our mother's breast is going dry. She's taking all green into her heart and will not turn back until we call her by her name. When Earth Becomes an It by Mary Lou Awiakta. So that's our poem. Ty, does it make you laugh? No, but that's kind of, that's quite a name for the author. It is a funny name, yeah. And notice the personification here. It's pretty common to call Earth Mother Earth but they really are emphasizing it by saying her heart, she is taking all the green into her heart. So um, they're really making it seem like she's this person who's going to die away if we don't take care of her. Are we after? <laughs> yes, Aryanch. That name is going to be hard to say. Yes, I, let's I, try it out. And um, the first name and last name together. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Awiakta. And then Awiakta. I think it's fun to say, but it will take some time. Okay, boys and girls, let's get to our new spelling lesson.
Okay. Um, for our new lesson, we're going to begin with the word, oh, Almanza would love this lesson. Our first word is dessert. Mm. Dessert. Who loves dessert? Does anybody want to share their, share their favorite dessert? Emma, what's your favorite dessert? Ice cream. Ooh, perfect for summertime. Saha Nasri, what about you? Chocolate cake and chocolate ice cream. Oh, that sounds delicious. Marcus, what's your favorite dessert? Ice cream cake. Oh, ice cream cake specifically. Interesting. Let's hear one more from Alina. Ice cream and also this. Sadly, I can't eat or drink right now. I just want a coat of and a, and a cookie dough oh, ice cream. Because of Ramadan? Yeah. I love cookies, too. Um, I had that notification on my calendar that Ramadan just began recently. And um, also, you mentioned that the other day. The food words are making you hungry. I'm sorry, sweetie. It's okay. I can bear it. Okay, let's sound out the word dessert. Okay, can you sound it out with me? Dessert. Two syllables. Now, a lot of people get this confused with desert like the place this one is going to have a double s so it's dessert d s in the first syllable three sounds and then another s in the second syllable so make sure you've got a double s okay next syllable what do you hear z er t three sounds using er the er of her so dessert Make sure you double that S. Pick up your pencil and write it. Okay. Make sure to double that S. Oh. Alexander, I'll give you another chance since other people are still writing. The first syllable is desert. But we do kind of say an I sound. But you need an E in the first syllable instead. Ariyanch? Um, so Miss Campbell has a rule like this of the difference between um, desert and dessert. Um, oh, did you learn this in first grade? Um, I wasn't in, in Miss Campbell's class in first grade. It's when um, we had to watch her live classes. Um, she when said, I had, um, when I was sick. Yeah. Um, he, she said, um, for desert, like the desert in Africa, um, that you would want um, less sand and more cookies. Oh, good point. Less sand and more cookies. Or we could say more s'mores. There's a dessert starting with an S. More s'mores. Okay, let's do dessert. D, S, syllable break. Er, t, dessert. Oh, more s'mores. No, more Snickers. Oh, Snickers, that would work too. Okay, dessert. And I have a whole bunch more that start with S. In the first syllable, we have an unstressed syllable here, so we're gonna put a thinking cap. Good job, Alina. And the first z is silent. Now the second one says a dessert sound. Z 
Good job, that's a two. And we have er, the earth, her. Dessert is a noun. Oh, I'm afraid the rest of this lesson's gonna make you hungry too. Or actually, maybe this is gonna do the opposite of it with this next word. Now, when you eat dessert, it goes into your mouth and you start to digest it. It means that you break it apart. Parts of it become nutrients, just like um, for the owl pellets, the owls digest the parts of the animal, the little vole or shrew that they want to eat for nutrients. And then the parts that are not digestible, those are what you see in your owl pellet, the parts that they can't digest. Okay, so our word is digest. Can you sound it out with me? Digest, two syllables. First syllable, d i. I is in an open syllable saying its name. Next syllable, j, s, t, four sounds. It's g, j, saying its second sound because it's followed by an e. Digest. Pick up your pencil and write it, please. Digest, d, i, syllable break, j, s, t, digest. Check that your spelling matches mine. Saha Nasri, would you mark the word for us? Okay. First, we underline the i. Perfect. And in the, in the second syllable, we put it two on the G. Good. Good. What's next? I think that's all, actually. Yeah. It's a verb. It's a verb? Yep. It's a verb. Digest. Oh. Yeah. Now, for our next one, we're going to use, that is the base of the word digestible. Digestible means able to be digested. So, once again, connected to those owl pellets, digestible things are eaten by the owl and you don't end up seeing that in your pellet. But the things that are not digestible, those are what you'll see in your pellet. So digestible means something that you can digest, you're able to digest it. Please write digestible. We're gonna add the ibble suffix, kind of like the able suffix, but it's ibble. <laughs> Tig, are you back yet? <gasps> oh. Digestible. Show me the word when you're done, please.
t, i, syllable break, j, s, t, syllable break, i, syllable break, b, o, digestible. Our shop, would you mark the word for us? You underline the I. Good. Next syllable, you um you put a two on top of the G. Perfect. And then um next syllable, um you double underline uh silent E. Good. And jam number four. Perfect. And let's underline the but and all connected to it. Um, the manual would have us do a thinking cap and underline this because it's open syllable but not saying its name. But it's saying an I sound, digestible. Actually, it ends up saying kind of an I sound, doesn't it? Digestible. So let's put a thinking cap still, but not underlining it. Good job, Ariyanch. Now let's put a DJ for adjective. We have one more word, and this one's going to make you hungry, too. I'm sorry. Our last word is marmalade. Can you say marmalade? Marmalade is like a jam or jelly specifically from citrusy fruits, like oranges. A jam or a jelly. Marmalade. I don't remember if we've heard of that in Farmer Boy. I think we have. But it's especially in older books that you'll hear it. Tyke? In, the, in this series of comic books that I read called The Bad Guys, um, they, um, the real bad guy is a, well, for starters, it's a talking animal series, um, but the real bad guy is a guinea pig named Dr. Rupert Marmalade. That's just very cute. Think, it just made me think of that. Maybe that's what you can call, uh, the animal in your owl pellet. Nick, name him Dr. Marmalade. Oh, yeah. It sounds like lemonade, and my sister loves limeade, so. Oh, limeades are tasty. I love those, too. Okay, so marmalade is the word. Can you sound it out with me? Marmalade. Three syllables. We say marmalade because that middle syllable is unstressed, but we think to spell marmalade. First syllable, m r. Two sounds. That's just the phonogram, R. Next up is M, A, two sounds. Finally, last syllable is L, A, D, three sounds. A says its name because of a silent finally job one. Marmalade, pick up your pencil and write it please. Alexander? Um. Oh, yeah. A little quick thing on the owl pellet thing. Um, if I got to choose to name all, if I got, I, I really want to find two skulls. This is what I'm aiming for, to find two skulls. <laughs> that would I be interesting. M R syllable break M A syllable break O A D silent final E marmalade. Samhita, would you mark the word for us? S 
So you underline the R because it's a phonogram. Two letter phonogram. Mm -hmm. Marmalade. And then you put a thinking cap over the A. Good. Underline the A and then underline the D and then double underline the E. Perfect. And job number one. That's right. And can you think of the part of speech? Is it a noun? Yep, it is a noun. Good job. Okay, let's write them in cursive now. Dessert. Digest. Digestible. And marmalade. Dikshita? There's another word for digest. What is it? Digestion. Ooh, they should have done digestion. That's a very good point. That turns it into a noun. But digestible is an interesting one to do, especially considering our owl, owl pellet day, because it's all of the things that are not digestible that you've got in that pellet. Okay, boys and girls, for our cursive practice today, let's go ahead and write the beginning of that new poem, When People Call Earth It, or When Earth Becomes an It. All right, we'll do that for our cursive practice. I'll go ahead and write it with you. Let's put quotation marks at the beginning since we're quoting from a specific poem. And we'll say, when the people call earth mother, comma, and into those quotation marks. I'll have you write that part and then we'll continue. Could you please, um, could you please say that again? When the people call Earth mother,
Then we'll say, they take with love. When the people call Earth Mother, they take with love and with love give back. So that all may live. End of the quotation marks. When the people call Earth mother, they take with love and with love give back so that all may live. Can you say that one more time? When the people call Earth mother, they take with love and with love give back so that all may live. Marcus, it's okay if you don't get all of it, but I want you to get at least the start of it, okay? Excellent, Marcolina. Great job, Ariyanch and Alexander. Can everyone else hold theirs up when they're done? Alexander? After you finish the owl pellet, um, like with all the bones, what do you do with it? Um, I would, if I were you, I'd put it in the little Ziploc bag that I gave you. And then tomorrow we're going to make a graph, graphing the bones. So you'll need to use it for that. Just one thing, like will we make a skeleton of it? like? Um, that is up to you. If you want to make it into a skeleton, you can. But um, the assignment for tomorrow is actually going to make like a bar graph with it. I'll show you kind of what that would look like in your math workbook. And um, I kind of have one more question. Kind of like uh, this a little bit, uh -huh. but showing the types of bones. So like a vertebrae would be one. And you would show me how many vertebrae you found. Um, one more thing, um, mm -hmm. um, in the video today, I don't, there may not be any vertebrae because the guy who did it, like there was no vertebrae in his. Okay. I think you will have vertebrae. Okay. Thank Are you. Much. Actually, and the guy actually did find vertebrae, but he was so confused with it from the fur because the, the vertebrae was so small. Yeah, so I think that will probably be similar to your experience. They are tiny. And so um, it probably will end up being something. Here's like an eraser on this mechanical pencil that it would be kind of similar to. But even smaller than this 
and you will have to really clean it carefully to tell what it is. And it's possible that some of the vertebrae would be thrown away because you're not able to see them. That's okay if that happens, but as many as possible, try to find the little vertebrae. They will be in your owl pellets. You just have to look pretty carefully for them because they'll be the smallest of all the bones. Good questions on that. Okay, boys and girls, we're going to move on to well-ordered language next. So let's take out our well-ordered language workbook and we're gonna start with some review of the jingles that we were doing yesterday. Let's review um, our verb song, conjunction, and synonyms, antonyms, and homonyms. We'll start with verbs. A verb is a part of speech. A verb shows action or a state of being. A verb shows action or a state of being. A verb is a part of speech. A verb is a part of speech. A verb shows action or a state of being. A verb shows action or a state of being. A verb shows action or a state of being. A verb shows action or a Okay, here's verbs and helping verbs. I'll get the conjunction jingle up next. And would you all start turning to page 160? That's where we're going to be working from as soon as we're done. Page 160. Ariyanch? I thought the pages for today were um, 156 to 159. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I was flipping ahead. Three. You're exactly right, 156. Page 156. I was looking at the next lesson. All right, conjunction. A conjunction, conjunction is a part of, part of speech. speech. It joins it elements, elements of, of the same, same grain or, or name. When two, when two or, or more words are joined this, this way, they're called, they're called compounds. compounds. A conjunction, a conjunction is, a is a part of speech. Of speech. It, joins it joins elements of the same grain or, or name. When two, two or, or more, more words are joined this way, this way they're called, they're called compounds. compounds. Okay, and finally, let's go over that synonym, antonym, and homonym new jingle. You guys remember it? Synonyms, antonyms, and homonyms. Synonyms are words, are words that, that mean, mean almost, almost the same, same thing. thing. Antonyms, Antonyms are words, are words that, have that have the opposite, opposite meaning, meaning of 
love another, another world. Here's the examples. Synonyms. Little, little, and small. And small. Short, and small. Short and tall. Through the ball. Walk through the mall. Synonyms. Antonyms. And homonyms. Synonyms. Antonyms. And homonyms. Oh, so catchy. Okay, that is all of our jingles to review. Um, and I want to go over the very top of this page to begin. For the review it, what page? Specifically, page 156. 156. At the top, it says, Can you think of a synonym for jump? I remember synonyms are words that have almost this or that mean almost the same thing. What is a synonym for jump tide? What page is this again? Um, by now, 156. And the answer is trash. What is it? Trash. A synonym for jump? Yeah. Uh, trash? Mm. Can yeah. you think of something that is similar in meaning to jump? Dirty? No. Um, Not junk. Oh, I hear. You're thinking I'm saying junk. It's jump. The action, jump. Oh. Oh. You thought I said junk, didn't you? Yes. Oh, that would make sense. Me too. Junk and trash are synonyms. Good job. This is jump. Okay. Hop. Spring. Hop. Good. Going. Good. All good synonyms. Can somebody tell me another synonym for jump? Alexander? Jumping. Jumped. So those are different forms of the same word, but a synonym is going to be hop, boing, a leap, things like that. They're different words altogether, but they mean something similar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll leave it at that for now. But let's go over this section where it says, how does a sentence change when another verb is added to it? And using the following sentences, we're going to construct new sentences by adding a conjunction, either and or or. Those are the two ones, two conjunctions that we can use. And another verb to form compound verbs. Sentence one says the spring birds chirped to one another. Now that's a complete sentence, but let's add another verb. Kriti, can you think of another predicate verb for what the spring birds might do? Um, the spring birds might, like, do you mean the winter, like, what season? Um, in the springtime, they chirp springtime. and what would they do to one another? Um, they would chirp. I know this what? is kind of a tricky one. And yeah, fly to one another or flew to one another to make it past tense as well. Emma, can you think of another one that could work? And whistle to each other. Ooh, little whistle. That's cute too. Either of those work. The spring birds chirped and flew or chirped and whistled. Let's make it past tense, not fly, but flew, since this one is past tense. Marcus, are you on page 156? 
We can't have our head down. This is time for us to be do doing work. Yes, ma'am? Okay, Josiah, can you tell me another predicate verb that might be what flowers do? Joyously, the flowers grew and... Spring. What? Spring, did you say? Yeah. Um, spring means kind of to jump if we're using it as an action. I don't think the flowers would jump. So can you think of another one? This is a tricky one too. What action would a flower do? I'll have Alexander help out since it looks like he's got one. Okay. Joyously the brows grew to, so is it still jumped? Like, or can it be no, something we want else? Another predicate verb to go with flowers. What's something okay. flowers could do? Um. And grew and bloomed. Grew and bloomed. Ooh, very good one. That's what I was gonna say. Obviously, the flowers grew and bloomed. Me too. Good one. Oh, now number three. Oh, we're just barely past April sixth. These are all good fitting sentences, all about April flowers. On April 6th, a storm drenched the ground. We want another predicate verb to go with storm. What else might a storm do? Okay, I'll get back to Josiah since he couldn't help with the last one. Struck. Oh, and struck the ground. Interesting. Let's do that. Drenched and struck the ground. I guess there is a lightning strike. Okay, and Ariant, can you do the last one for us? In the garden, the crocus flowers wilted. <gasps> what might they do? I don't know what the, those type of flowers are. Um, just think of in general what a flower might do. Um, could I help you with a word kind of like wilted? Wilted yeah, is when they start to kind of come down. We could say drooped. Okay. Sure. Or actually, we could also say died. The crocus flowers wilted and died. Because when a flower starts, starts to wilt, that means it's about to die. I was thinking of putting the word... Um, or die, or die because it's we haven't done or. Good call. Let's do that. Let's include that conjunction or. In the garden, the crocus flowers wilted or died. And that makes sense. Maybe in the garden, some of the flowers wilted and then some of the flowers died. Okay, great thoughts. Now, the next part of our chapter um, I mean, our pages for today, we're going to go over how to mark sentences with compound verbs. Just like compound subjects, we are not going to um, have a new label. These labels are exactly like before. But for the first time, we're going to have possibly two predicate verbs. Okay. I would love for Marcus to read sentence one for us. And we're going to try to find the conjunction in compound verbs in this sentence. Can you read sentence one? This is on page 157. Outside the tent, Lucy watched Dan ponder the distant stars. Good job, Marcus. Do you see a conjunction? Mm 
No. There is a conjunction. The ones that we've been seeing are and and nor. I mean, and and or. Do you see one of those words? And between watched and pondered. And between watched and pondered. Very good. We're going to put wings around it. Remember that? Next, we're going to look for prepositional phrases. Alina, do you see a prepositional phrase? Outside the tent. Perfect. Do you guys remember that hint of with introductory prepositional phrases that the comma comes after it? And that tells you like where the prepositional phrase is. Let's put parentheses around it. Outside is the preposition. Tint is the object of the preposition. The is an adjective. I should see pencils in hand, marking this with me. Great job for those doing that. Now, Arshav, could you help us with the subject? And I'll also have you look for predicate verb. Or there might be more than one. There are two predicate verbs, which are watched and pondered. Very good. And the subject is Lucy. Excellent. The pig. <laughs> Lucy the pig is watching and pondering the distant stars. She's a deep thinker, that Lucy. She loves her constellations. Okay, so Lucy watched and pondered the distant stars. Now, in this chapter, we're going to see a lot of these compound verbs, but just keep in mind that, rem that the conjunctions will still sometimes join two subjects, sometimes two predicate verbs. So think about what's happening. If you picture Lucy watching and pondering the distant stars, these are the two actions. Okay, the next thing we look for is a DO, direct object. Do we have one? Do we have a DO, direct object? Harika, what is it? Our direct object is stars. Good. It's what Lucy watched and pondered. Mm -hmm. Let's circle it and put, put DO underneath it. Now, what do we have left to mark? Aryansh? We have three things left to mark. First, Very good. What are they? Um, you, um, the so the modifies stars and same with distant. Excellent. And outside the tent modifies the predicate verbs because it's adverbial. Very good. Um, I need to both. I know, that's a very good question. Um, she is technically outside the tent for both watching and pondering. So that's what I'm going to do. ADV prep, and I'm going to point it to both predicate verbs. All right, that's a new part, boys and girls. So do you see that I'm pointing it to two verbs? Because technically, it's modifying two different actions. Okay, I'd like you to do number two on your own, and then we're going to go over the answers. Mark number two, and then we'll go over it.
Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're finished marking it. Looks like others need a little bit more time. Samhita, are you finished? Could you tell us what you did? Just go through each part of speech. Um, so Lucy is the subject. For sentence what? two. Oh, okay. Um, Theo's the subject, then stretched and yawned is the predicate verb. And then loudly is modifying yawned. Good. Is this verb. one is just modifying yawned because you don't loudly stretch. Yeah. And then and is the conjunction. And then under the night sky is an adverbial prepositional phrase. So under is the preposition, and then sky is the object of the preposition. The night sky is modifying sky. Very good. All right, make sure yours looks like this, boys and girls. Miss Garner, I did night and sky as the uh, object of the preposition. Um, I think it would be best for sky to be the object of the preposition and night to be an adjective. So I'd like you to change it to that, but I understand that you did that under night sky, but I'd like it to be under sky. What kind of sky? Night sky. Sometimes it's a little different than that. Like if it was a hot dog, you can't just say dog. What kind of dog? Hot dog. Hot dog altogether is um, an object. But with this one, I think we can separate it out. Okay, you're gonna do the next two pages on your own for homework. I just posted them in BrightThinker. So that will be on your to-do list for today to finish these pages, okay? And let's put this away at this point and take out orthography notebooks to write down today's words. And by the way, boys and girls, you currently have nothing for math in BrightThinker because I'm pushing back our lessons one day. So I'll probably still add something for a little extra review, but we are not gonna do any workbook pages because I think we need a little more practice on what we did yesterday. Do any of you feel like you'd like a little more practice on what we did yesterday? Okay. Well, here we go, lesson 98 on page 62. Our first word was dessert. More s'mores, less sand. More s'mores. After dessert, digest. After digest, digestible. And finally, marmalade. Marcus, it doesn't look like your notebook is open. We're on page 62 of our notebook. Okay, boys and girls, that is all. Please show me your words as soon as you're done writing. But we're not going to do any sorting because we are out of time for literacy. So just show me your words once you're done. Tag? Um, 
I have a sen I have a sentence that uses all four of the words. Oh, let me hear it. For dessert, I will digest the digestible marmalade. Nice, perfect use of all of them. And good use of an introductory prep prepositional phrase. Or it could have been for my next trick, I would digest the, di the, digestive mar the digestible marmalade that I had for dessert. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much, Sahanasri, Alina. Everyone, once again, show me your words when you're done. Okay, let's put that away for now. We're going to be taking some notes in our math notebook. We're also going to be using our whiteboard and marker. And finally, I do want to go over the answers to your homework from yesterday. So those are the three things you need. Notebook, workbook, and whiteboard and marker. I count whiteboard and marker as one thing basically. It's like salt and pepper shakers. They just go together. Okay, boys and girls, uh, the page 103 we did together, so I don't want to go over that one, but I do want us to go over the answers to the next three pages. Okay. This one says, use number lines to compare fractions. How did you guys feel about this page? Using number lines to compare. Thumbs up, sideways, or down. I see mainly up, some sideways. Okay, uh, Josiah, could you tell us what your answers are on the bottom of 104? I said that five, six were greater than 30 fifths. Five, six are greater than three fifths. You got the same thing. Look, here's five sixths, here's three fifths. Very good. Now, which one is less, two fifths or three sixths? Um, could I hear the answer from, uh, let's hear from Emma. Two fifths or three sixths? Sorry, I had to, um, wait, what was the one you wanted me to do? This one, which is less, two fifths or three sixths? Which one's less? Oh, this one. Um, which one's less? Three sixths? No, two fifths. Mm -hmm. Two fifths. You see how two fifths is closer to zero? Three sixths mm -hmm. is closer to one. That was number 10 on page 104. Who got those answers on page 104? Okay, now here is comparing with the benchmark of one half. How did you guys feel about this one? I think this probably was a little easier too because you have the visual already. So four sixths and one half. Here's four sixths, here's one half. Tag, did you say that four six were greater than or less than one half? I said four six were greater than one half. Good. Who got the same thing? Greater than one half because it's closer to one. Now, one eighth and one half is the next one. Here's one eighth. Here's one half. 
Is one eighth less than or greater than one half? Dikshita, did you put less than or greater than? Um, uh, we put, let me see, let me see, one half, one half. Is one eighth less than or greater than one half? Uh, it's less than. One less eighth. than, good. So, Arsha, if we know four six is greater than one half and one eighth is less than one half, what does that mean comparing four six than one eighth? Four sixths is greater than uh, one eighth. Perfect. Okay, now the next page, I can imagine you having more questions on this one. Who had more questions on this page? Okay. It doesn't tell you how to compare. So you could have used your number lines. You can use these number lines to help you. Or you, can't, you could um, change the fractions. And we're going to focus on least common multiple today, thinking through what are the different factors that we can change the denominator to. Okay, now number 12, could I have Tig share his answer and tell how you got it? For number 12, I, I thought, well, not exactly thought, but I put in the answer of six seven of six sevenths. Six sevenths is greater. So how do you know it's greater? Um, because four is closer to zero. Good. And the denominators are the same, so we can just focus on the numerator. Can I share my um, answers for the rest of the page? I'll have you share number 13 as well, but then I'll have somebody else. For number 13, I got two-fifths. Good. Why is it two-fifths, not two-tenths? Because if I put two-tenths, then the, <clears throat> then the parts of the fraction would be smaller, so um, that it wouldn't cover up as much space as it would two-fifths. Very good. Yeah. The numerators are the same. We can focus on the denominator and think each of those tenths is smaller. Ariat, what did you do for number 14? But before before I answer that um, question, 17 um, to 19, those questions were impossibly hard. Um, we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer for 14 is that 7 twelfths is greater because when you equal the fractions, one half becomes six twelfths. Very and, good. Yeah. And then seven twelfths is greater than six twelfths because seven's closer to 12 than six is. Excellent. That's exactly right. That's what I would do if I were you as well. Think of one half as equivalent to six twelfths. We're going to be writing that in our notebook today as well all of the fractions equivalent to one half that you'll need to know for the unit. Now, next is five elevenths and one half. Which one is less? Alexander? Sorry, I'm just trying to get this coat on. Because that's a calm to that, but okay. Um, um, Five elevenths is less. Good. Because yeah, five elevenths is go ahead. Because, like you said, one half could equal six twelfths. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that six is a bigger number than five, and you know it's closer to um, the numerator. No, 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 the denominator. Good. Another way to think about this is that 5 is a little less than half of 11. Because mm -hmm. 5 is half of 10. And six so if this was 12. 5 tenths, that would be exactly the same as 1 half. But it's 5 elevenths. Elevenths are a little bit smaller. Okay, and then finally, 7 twelfths and 5 elevenths. 
Remember that 5 elevenths is a little smaller than 1 half, and 7 twelfths, that's a little more than 1 half. So that means 5 elevenths is less. Okay, now I totally get if this next part had um, you a little confused. So let's go over it. Now, 17 has a comparison of like fractions. All of them are the same denominator. So hopefully that one is a little easier. Marcus, can you share your answer for that one? Say that again. Can you share your answer for number 17? We're gonna order them from greatest to least. Okay. 11. 11, no, by 11 first, and then no, no, 7 to 11 or for second, and then no, 5 to 11 for last. Great job, Marcus. That's exactly right. Start with 11 elevenths. 5 elevenths is the least. Now, he's telling us here, compare each of the fractions with 1 half. That's going to help you. 1 half is the same as 3 sixths, which is the same as 5 tenths. So if you know that, you can think through which ones are less than one half and which ones are more than one half. Alexander, what's your answer to number 18? So first comes two thirds, second, um, five six, and then four, last but not least, four tenths. So four tenths is the least, very good. But you're actually gonna have to switch these two. Five sixths is the most, and then two thirds. Because oh. two thirds is the same as four sixths. Mm -hmm. And four sixths is smaller than five sixths. But if you didn't oh. get that right, it's okay. Dikshita, what about 19? Miss Garner, I have to leave right now. Okay, that's fine, sweetheart. I'm um, okay. finished the pages. I'm going to post some extra practice on Bright Thinker later okay. today that you can do. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ruthie, can you share your answer for number 19? What? Can you share your answer for number 19? What page again? Yep, page 106. Okay, so page um, number 19? Yes. Okay. I didn't do this page. That, that was part of your homework posted on Bright Thinker. That means you'll need to do that today. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now, the one that's greatest is three fourths. It's the only one more than one half. Okay? That's the way I would think about that. I know that three fourths is greater than one half, so that's going to be the biggest. Then I know one third is less than one half, which means one half is right in the middle. That makes sense. All right, and then finally, one half, two thirds, and three fourths. Now, three fourths is a little bigger than two thirds. You could have even used your um, fraction strips for this. Or you could use this number line to help you. Do you see that? Let's see, we're comparing two thirds and three fourths. Here's two thirds, here's three fourths. Do you see how three fourths is bigger than two thirds? Because you're just one away from one with these kind of smaller parts. This one, you're one part away from one, but these are bigger parts, so it's going to take more to get to one. So three fourths, two thirds, and then one half is last. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more about how to compare these fractions. 
we're going to use our math notebook for this. And I want to go over two strategies that I think will help you. Okay, so let's put our name and date at the top. April 15th, this is math, lesson 14.4 again. Can you move it up a little more? Yeah, sorry. Okay, now one thing that I think is going to really help you boys and girls is to think through the fractions that are equivalent to one half. And I would say pretty soon you should just have these memorized even, okay? So let's write fractions equivalent to one half. So one half would technically be if there's something divided into two parts, just one of those parts. But there's uh, all sorts of other fractions that are equivalent to that, that I think will become really easy to memorize. Now, going one up in the numerator to two, Basically, if we double that, it's four for the denominator. Because any fraction equivalent to one half is, is just that the numerator is half of the denominator. So like one half, two fourths, it's two out of four parts. It's always going to be that the numerator is half of the denominator. Or you could think of the denominator as just two times the numerator. So let's do it for three. With a numerator of three, what's the denominator going to be? Alexander? Uh. Six, but I was doing this. Oh, I see. Yeah. So one half, two fourths, three sixths. Notice what's happening at the bottom, too. We're skip counting by twos. So in all of these, we've got exactly these equivalent fractions to one half. Let's go up to four. And what's the denominator going to be? Eight, right? Four eighths. Then we're going to have five. What comes next? Tenths. Good. And finally, six twelfths. Those are all of the ones that you'll need to really memorize because in our third grade book, the biggest fractions we get to are in twelfths. That's the largest denominator that you're going to work with. So if you're working with something where it says like maybe three eighths, hopefully pretty soon you'll start knowing just off the top of your head, well, I know four eighths is the same as one half. So three eighths, that's less than one half. Or if I said seven tenths, is that bigger than one half or less than one half? Seven tenths. Bigger. That's right. What about one fourth? Is that less than one half or more than one half? Smaller or bigger than one half? 
it's smaller, it's less than. Sorry, I don't know what the best way to represent that just with your hands, but what about seven twelfths? Is that more than one half or less than one half, Alexander? More than one half. And also you could do the less than and greater than symbol. Yeah, the less than greater than symbol would work. It's just a little tricky. I can't tell what direction you're pointing it at. Okay, so hopefully that will really help you boys and girls. Once you have memorized these fractions equivalent to one half, it's going to basically help you to uh, have that, um, the benchmark of one half. Just in your mind, you can think through all of these fractions that are one half so that if you get that fraction three fourths, you know that's going to be greater than one half since you've memorized that two fourths is equal to one half. Okay, now one other thing I wanted to go through with you is finding multiples to uh, change our denominator. Now this is going back to what we were doing yesterday. Okay, let's take this one, five sixths and one fourth. If you have a question like this where you're supposed to compare five sixths and one fourth, now a faster way, of, um, the fastest way of doing this is to just have in mind that five sixths is greater than one half, since we know three sixths is equal to one half. One fourth, that's less than one half. So that should help you to compare those really quickly, right? Five sixths is greater than one fourth, since you know that five sixths is greater than a half and one fourth is less than one half. However, if we want to change our denominators, this is what I want you to do. I want you to start thinking through the multiples of both of these numbers. Basically, we're gonna go through our times tables for these numbers until we get to a number that's on both of the timetables. This is what we call least common multiple. And in our program, it doesn't say least common multiple for third grade, but that's basically what you're doing. And you'll continue doing that more in fourth, fifth grade and so on. So I think it's gonna be helpful if you just know it like that. Okay, who can tell me the first few times tables for six. Ariyanch? I think I know what the number is. Excellent. But let's go through just the times tables first. So should I do it in twos or threes? Um, skip count by sixes. Go through the six times oh. tables. Okay. 6, 12, 18, 24, 32. Good. I'll leave it at that. 6, 12, 18, 24. Now let's do the same thing for 4. Samhita, can you tell me the multiples of 4? Four? 4, 4, 8, 12, 16, 24. Now at this point, you should stop and to see, look at that. We just wrote the same number on both of these times tables. What is it? 12. 12. That tells us that 12 is the least common multiple because it's the lowest number that both six and four can go into. Mm -hmm. Okay, we call that least common multiple. And you're gonna do that more and more as you get older. And they'll even call it by a nickname, LCM. Ms. Gardner, can you move a sheet a little down? Yes. So basically what we were doing there is just finding what can be our new denominator. 
by going through the factors of, um, or going through the multiples of six and then going through the multiples of four and finding the common multiple, that means it's the same for both, and we want it to be the least possible. Like 24 would be a multiple for both of these, but we would rather work with twelfths than twenty-fourths. We want to work with the lowest fractions possible. Now, once you know that, we can convert these to twelfths, right? And I think you guys are doing pretty well at that part, knowing that like six times two equals 12, which means we're also gonna multiply by two at the top. Four times three is 12, which means we're also gonna multiply by three at the top, right? That's how we get to our new fractions. And then we can compare like fractions, but um, this is a really good way to do it. Actually write out the multiples of that number. 6, 12, 18, 24, 4, 8, 12. As soon as you get to a number that's on both of your times tables, it's a multiple of both numbers, then that means that can be your new denominator. Does that make sense? Okay. I hope that will be helpful for you. Um, I'm going to post for a bright finger assignment today just a little bit of extra practice that you'll do in your math notebook, um, just comparing some fractions, okay? And we'll also do a little bit of ordering fractions, maybe with three different fractions, and you put them in order of greatest to least. We'll do a little bit more of that. Alexander? I just want to let you know to be on the lookout for like um, owl pillow pictures because I want to like text it to you on email. So. Oh, I know. I'm looking forward to seeing the pictures. Um, I for That's a great reminder. For the owl pellet assignment, I said that for today, I want you to send me a picture of you dissecting the owl pellet. That's the only thing you have to do today um, as like turning in an assignment is just sending me a picture of you doing it. And I've got the chart for you to look at. And on that chart, I want you to think about what animal is probably inside of your owl pellet. Samhita? What kind of owl is this from? Um, that's a good question. These ones are pretty big, so it may be like a horned owl because they're pretty large pellets, but I'm not actually positive about that. Um, let really me go cool. ahead and show you the assignment for today. Ariyanch? So what do we do about, like, you said we need to send you a pitch a picture of us dissecting the owl pellet. So like, do you want us to be like in the middle of dissecting it or at the beginning or end? Um, It doesn't really matter. I would love to have maybe you with all of your tools showing, cutting it open and getting some bones. Maybe you could hold up some of the bones. It's not precise. Just ask your parents if they could take you a picture of you doing the lab at some point. Oh, okay. So I'll do it like in the middle. Yeah, middle would work. Okay, sorry, let me present over to my full screen. Hi, here is the chart that I was talking to you guys about and that Alexander was holding up. That's what a rodent skull would look like. The shrew is the one with kind of a pointier snout. And then here's a mole and here's a bird. And a bunch of their limbs are a little bit different. Here's the jawbone that you might see. 
the scapula, the forelimb, hind limb is like their legs, but you know animals don't have arms and legs. They are called forelimbs, which is in the front, and hind limbs are in the back. The pelvic bone is the hip bone, which has a little hole since it's a ball and socket joint. So no matter what kind of animal it is, there should be a little hole, but that might help you to figure out what kind of animal it is. And here's the different rib bones. These also might be easy to miss. So really try to find some of those rib bones, but they might get it kind of mixed in with some of the dried grass, unfortunately. And here's the vertebrae. They make them look big, but they're actually very tiny. And it looks like that's not really sorted according to animal. So the vertebrae is just going to be these little tiny, like almost teeth. Okay. So it's okay if you end up losing some of the ribs, some of the vertebrae, but I want you to find as many as possible and try to figure out what kind of animal your owl ate and then save it so that tomorrow we can make a chart to graph out the bones. Who's ready? Oh, I hope you guys are really going to enjoy it today. I know some of you have some extra questions. Let's get a few last questions before we go. Kruthi? Um, not really a question, but um, I have a loose tooth and hopefully it doesn't get mixed in with the bones. Oh, I know. I hope that. Oh, that would be gross. <laughs> Although your teeth, I'm sure, are much bigger than the little vertebrae of the animal. I kind of have, like, I have three wiggly to teeth. Oh, I hope none of those fall out. Our shop? Um, you said it was going to be hairy at ACT Aspire, but uh, well, what is it going to be like? Is it going to be hard, but hairy or soft? Um, kind of dried. These also were from last year because they were ordered for last year's students and then they couldn't do it because of COVID. So they're kind of, they're more dried out. Um, so I don't, there's not going to be anything really soft inside. It's going to be like dry, like hay, and even the fur would be kind of dry if there is any fur inside. Okay. Yes, Ariyach? Uh, when can we leave the meeting now? Because I want to do that right now. You want to do it right now? Who else wants to do it immediately after class? I would want to do it if I were you. First I'm thing. jealous because I loved doing it the last time I did it with the class, and I don't have one to do it. But you guys are going to have so much fun. Samhita? Mm -hmm. Where 